Hey, y'all, and welcome to Trials to Triumphs. I'm Ashley Blaine Featherson Jenkins, but you can call me ABFJ. This week, the original dream girl, Tony Award-nominated multi-hyphenate Cheryl Lee Ralph talks to me about what it takes to be a D-I-V-A, a diva, and how to rest in the truth that we will never miss anything that is for us. As a musical theater girl myself, I've admired Miss Cheryl basically forever. But since meeting her over a decade ago, she's been a beacon of light in my life. She's been especially resonant for me when I feel boxed in as the entertainment industry tries to define and limit who I am and who I can be. One day, you're the next big thing and the next yesterday's news. It can be a roller coaster if you're not careful. Miss Cheryl has been in the industry for over 40 years, but that kind of longevity certainly doesn't come without its trials. One day, a casting director was dropping her da- daughter off, and she looked at me and she said, Shirley Ralph, how are you? What are you doing? I had that moment where I said, well, you know, I'm not working right now. And she stopped and she looked at me and she said, excuse me? You are not working right now? She said, oh, you must not want to work. Or you've forgotten who you are. Either that or you've forgotten who you are. And that put me on a whole nother path to start all over again. Yes, even Cheryl Lee Ralph had to remember who she is, who she is, and what she has to offer the world. And in our Sankofa moment, Cheryl Lee Ralph reveals her favorite diva of all time. Believe it or not, she's in the Bible. She says, hold up, I am the queen, the queen bee. I do not drop it like it's hot for no drunk king, much less a drunk king and his boys. Oh my goodness. So I have to say. Yes. This is a big lifetime moment for me. I literally, I'm like, honestly, I'll be honest, I'm trembling with excitement. This is so exciting to me. I just can't believe it. It's it's just, it's it's fantastic. So I want to start with some icebreaker Mm -hmm. questions. Are you ready? Come on. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Okay. Define the word diva. What does that Mm -hmm. word mean to you? You know, for me, it's it's an acronym, meaning each letter in the word means something. So for me, diva has always been divinely inspired, victoriously alive, awesome, audacious, you know, and if it were Sunday, we would be anointed. Mm. So that's what diva means to me. It's much more than bad attitude. It's much more than bad reputation. It's much, much more than selfish or self-centered ways. It's much more than that. It is divinely inspired, victoriously alive, aware. Wow. Yeah. Well, fun fact, my dog's name is Diva because I too love Ah! the word (laughs) Diva. We knew she was Diva and she has lived up to her name. In every sense of the word. (laughs) And there you go. So, because we're musical theater Mm -hmm. girls, I want to know what, two questions. Okay, so what is your Mm all-time favorite musical? And Mm. what is your favorite musical theater song to sing? My all-time favorite would have to be the one that I was part of creating. (laughs) The one that is a part of musical theater history. The one that people all over the world want to be a part of. The one that I created the role of Dina Jones. How could I (laughs) not love Dream Girls? It was a trick question, obviously. No, I'm just (laughs) (laughs) Okay, so favorite song to sing? Every girl has her own special dream and your dreams just about to come true. Life's not as bad as it may seem if you open your eyes to what's in front of you. You're your own dream, girl. Girl, make yourself happy. Thank you. There you go. Oh, of course. You see, I I remade that song, right? Oh, but. wow! Now I'm in yeah. tears. 
People love that song for whatever reason. Uh, they just love it. Oh, oh my goodness. And you just sang it for me. There you go. Make your own self happy. Oh, yeah. wow. I'm just having such a moment, you know. I went to school for musical theater, and that is, you know, a <laughs> degree or, or a discipline yeah. uh, that people are like, wait, what? <laughs> like, why are you going to school for that? But I'm having such a moment yeah. because I saw you doing it. I saw you doing it. I saw you achieve pinnacles of success doing it. Um and so I, I you were that you were the person that I had as like a beacon of like if she can do it I can do it too. You you were the the light at the end of the tunnel for me. And so to have you here singing a musical theater song is just wow wow wow. God is so amazing. So amazing. So thank you. I don't know <sighs> First of all, I don't know if you ever read my book, but yes. it, when you read the book, you'll see that my career has been about choices so that others that came behind me, like you, could do and say exactly what you said to me, because it was for you. It was for you. And this was all very conscious. It was for you to be able to look at me and say, if I can, if she can do it, like you just said, I can do it. Because it was so difficult. It's still difficult now, but it was mm. so difficult. And even faced with those kind of obstacles, with the kind of things that people said to me, those who even tried to discourage me, and the industry itself trying to block me out, I still did it. Mm. I'm still doing it. And if I can still be doing it, you can still carry on and do it. And my father used to say, if you touch one person, that's a lot. So if all I ever touched was you to say that to me, every choice I've made, everything I've done, was all with worth it because you were that was a gift for you. Yep. I'm realizing mm. that so much of what I've truly been most inspired by with you is your heart and how mm. I've even felt like only one person mattered. And I'm grateful it's not just me, right? There's millions that you matter to, but I share that same type of um, motivation in my career. It's bigger than me. It's all, it always has been. Mm -hmm. It always will be. And I, too, am looking to the next generation to make sure that mm -hmm. I am a beacon of light. I am their light at the end of the tunnel mm -hmm. because I know how Absolutely. much it means. It truly That's is. Right. If I did not see you, I would not be here. It's that simple. I needed to see you. It was that we were put on the earth at the same time so we could achieve our goals, but you were there first and you had to be so that I could be here. And that is so extremely powerful and also amazing that God made it so that we can sit here and talk about it. Like that is powerful. I want to go to the beginning. Yeah, We talked about Jamaica, but where do you call home? I know you grew up in New York as well. Um, between New York, Connecticut, New Jersey, California, mm. Jamaica, um, Philadelphia, all of those things, you know, I can find home. Wow. 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 Yeah. Wow. Okay. Yeah. And uh -huh. talk to me about- But I love Jamaica. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Jamaica is- I love Jamaica. I mean, it's yeah. everything. I love LA. I do love LA. Mm. You know, I- I I think it's the weather. I just, I love being as warm as I can be every day of my life. I love it. I love that. So home, but home is any one of those places. I'm sorry. No, yeah. that's great. No, that's good. I, I, I think that, I think home is truly where the heart is. And home is where you have experiences yeah. that, that matter to you. And I think that it's cool. You have so many places. I want right. to talk about your parents. Amazing parents. Dr. Stanley Ralph. Ivy Ralph, perfectly imperfect people, but what they did for me, oh my God, 
I could never, ever repay my parents for every sacrifice they made for me, every mistake they even made, every success they had. I, I love my parents. My father gave me a gift that I so appreciate now, and that was a great education that I did not have to pay for because they worked and they paid for it so that I would not leave with any kind of debt whatsoever. Mm. And I appreciate that. They gave me a spirit allowing me to overcome and carry on. And I know how much that means. And they loved me through every phase in my life. And I, I couldn't repay my parents for anything. My mother made some promises to me and I'm and I know from heaven she's going to make sure they come true too. Yeah. She will. What what is the greatest lesson you learned from both of your parents? You already told that us I, one from your dad. That one was really good. That's really good. It would have to be that I just as I am, I'm perfect. Just as I am, I'm enough. I don't have to prove myself to anybody at all other than those who really, really matter to me and it is important. But other than that, as long as I can look in the mirror and tell myself a true story and know that it's true, I'm good. Mm. Yeah. And the power of discernment. You know, you learn when you're little, everything gold is not gold. Thank you. Everything you think is good for you, it's not good for you. Every closed door is supposed to stay closed. Why you keep trying to knock down a door you are never supposed to open? Why? Right. Oh, they they taught me a lot, and some of it is still coming true. So, I, okay, so I now need to get into the beginning. What was going on in your life? I want, I need the insider tea of what was going on in your life and that like pre-dream girls, pre-dream girls days. What was going on? I was in college. I was, um, I had been the first runner up in the Miss Black Teenage America pageant. I got accepted into the first class of women at Rutgers University and that in itself was a trip, you know, crossing a gender line, breaking a gender line, you know, having them tell you what is female, what is male. You know, I couldn't major in theater because it was considered a female theater. And I was on the male campus of Rutgers College itself. And um, I started winning scholarships. Mm. And my dad was so happy, you know, to see my bill paid in full. I won the American College Theater Festival. I won the Irene Ryan Acting Scholarship. And um, I was making money acting. So this just paved the way for me to break with becoming a doctor, which was my mother's dream, the immigrant's dream for their child. And um, I pursued my own dream, the American father who said, this is your life. You better live it. Go for it. And um, mm -hmm. having those two paths to take it. No, I was going to be backed up. I might have to take hell for my mother, but she was going to be w w be with me, you know, in pursuing my dreams. And um, I went for it. And when I graduated, I um, would sing. You know, I had all, all these mentors, Virginia Capers, Rosalind Cash, Judy Pace. I mean, Beverly Todd, Beverly Manley out of Jamaica. You know, so, so many women, Pat Ramsey, you know, all very different women, but women who really took time to, even if all they did was say, have a conversation with me, they, they stuck with me, it meant something to me. So they all taught me so much about being a black woman in show business. So can you kind of take me to, what was this, this audition like for Dream Girls? I knew from day one, dream girls had something special. First of all, you had never, there was nothing like it. It, it hadn't been done. It wasn't a review. It was, a, it was going to be a scripted, a lot of it out of improv. I think about one to the completion of three years when it finally went from a germ of an idea to a full grown scripted musical music. You know, not just a musical review. We had done something absolutely that had not been done, had not been seen. And I knew it was going to be big. 
I just did not know that 40 years later that we would have been made such an indelible mark and people still try to not see the mark that we made on theater, but it is there. You know, that's what's so cool is that for me, that's what this podcast is all about, right? It's about the journey. And it's about knowing that someone, you you could have decided, dream girls, I'm just, this is just the pinnacle of success. I, I What else could happen over the next 40 years or whatever, right? But look. Girl, you know what could happen? Hey, to me, in my mind, I had to get married. I had to have some children. I had to have some place to put my DNA and pass on my legacy to speak Mm. for me and tell my story, to even be a better human being than me. When I look at my kids right now, I'm like, Cheryl, you did good, girl. That's right. And I have faith in my children. Some people say when they leave this earth, they, they know there'll be one child left to carry on. I will have two children left to carry on. And I'm going to be so mm. happy. I'll be very sad to take my last breath, but I know it. they, they will carry on. Yeah. Mm. That's the goal. That's the goal. That it's, makes me so happy. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, so you've been in the industry for over 40 years. I want to know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What was the most difficult season of your life slash career? Ooh, I think the most difficult season, believe it or not, it was a, a, an emotional crash. It was my my marriage wasn't working out and Moesha was just going sideways. And, every, and I'm a woman of balance. Balance is my essential word, balance. And I, I could feel my boat just rocking. And it was like that, that Bob Marley song, Please don't you rock my boat because I don't want my boat to be rocking. But my boat was just rocking and I was starting to get seasick and I was trying to hold on. But it was rough because I was going through the storm and it would be easy on one side and then the storm would hit me from the other side. And I said, God Sweet baby Jesus, send the grown one too. You got to help me because I'm not going to make this. Whoa. Mm. It was horrible. It was horrible. Mm. Horrible. Horrible. So horrible. But like a few years after that, I, I, I thought to myself, my God, am I washed up? Did I do the wrong thing? But I knew I did the right thing on both sides. Leaving both situations was the right thing for me to do. And... um. I, I, I think, wow, God is so good, you know, because one day I was taking my daughter to school. She was going to Immaculate Heart. But one day a casting director was dropping her da- daughter off and she looked at me and she said, Shirley Ralph, how are you? What are you doing? And I said, you know, I had that moment where I said, well, you know, I'm not working right now. She stopped and she looked at me and she said, excuse me, you are not working right now. She said, oh, you must not want to work. Because, or you've forgotten who you are. I was just like, is this woman talking to me on the steps of Immaculate Heart? Is this a come to Jesus moment? What's going on? Either that or you've forgotten who you are. And that put me on a whole nother path to start all over again. I guess I was just in a pause and didn't really know it. And that woman just helped me change wow. and figure it out. Wow, mm-hmm. wow, wow. Did did you forget who you were? Yeah, absolutely. Mm. Yeah, I was probably beached up. I was probably shored up on the beach with my wreck of a ship behind me. And I had to figure out, okay, we got to fix this and sail again. Yeah, because it's, you know, by this point, it was never just about me. You know, we were just talking about my kids and I had children and I had to figure it out. You can't just live on one show unless you have a great back-end deal. Yeah. Mm. Did you... Well, so that's the other thing, right? We all are like... We see these shows, whether it's Moesha or whatever, and we're like, 
this is the pinnacle of success. Everything must have been perfect. Of course, you were probably having 7,000 trillion offers after that. And you probably, and here you are saying, this show that if you are a Black person, especially um, between the ages of 25 and 40, you you grew up on Moesha, right? And to hear That's you right. say, That's exactly right? right? And to hear you say, it it wasn't good for me in the end. I had to, I had to make a choice for myself, and and after that, I had to jump ship. Wow. Okay, yeah, that's a different. You have jump. you jump. You just went into the water. Did you have a life jacket on at least? Were you at least? <laughs> no, no, I had no life jacket on, and in fact, um, I left, and they they said that D had gone off to Jamaica to start a reading program. I was principal in Jamaica somewhere. <laughs> wow. It's true. So this is what I want to know if, if you if you yeah. are okay with sharing. How did you you jumping ship? Was that a decision that was hard to make, or was that a decision that your gut told you you had to make? That was exactly right. Mm. My gut was like, you stay on this ship at your own personal peril. Hmm. And when that mm-hmm. became very obvious to me, I had to leave. And that was that was all there was to that. That was that. It was the right choice to make. Did, did you have a, was there a season after you left that you regretted it? I won't say that I regretted it, but I was definitely kind of lost. Yeah, yeah. Definitely kind of lost. Yeah. Yeah. Who who was supporting you during that time? My mother and my father, you know, oh man. My dad, uh, who uh, headed up the music department at church, you know, he was all, he was committed to Sundays at church. And my father found ways to be out in California, you know, one or two Sundays in the month. My mother just came out and my mother stayed with me for a while and, you know, my, my family. My family. Yeah. Family is everything. Yeah. Family is everything. Everything. If you have a good family, it is everything. And you are truly blessed because not everybody has great family. Yeah. It's a blessing. And also something else that's a blessing, because I'm thinking about this other mother, this casting director, who you came across on the steps of your daughter's school. Mm-hmm. I, I'm assuming you had never met this woman before. You you hadn't met her before. Mm-hmm. But yeah. she was sent to you at that very moment for a very specific reason. And that was to get you back on the ship, to get you in calm waters, and to have you set sail again. And so I yeah. think it's important. We have to, we have to be open. We have to be mindful of the little angels and the little reminders that God sends to us. It might not be in the package of your mother or your father, people that you know and you trust and you've known your whole life. It might be on a stranger. It might be from a stranger on the steps of your daughter's school. But I love that you were tapped in enough. You had enough discernment over your own life to say, this this is a message and I need to receive it. And so how did you, after you had this conversation that kind of made you say, whoa, wait a minute, how does this lady know my whole life? Hold on. How did you get back to who you are? What were the the steps that you took to getting back? Um, I went in search of a great agent Mm. or at least a better agent than the one I had at that time. And I just started to, I, it's, it's a phrase that I say to people all the time. I rose to the occasion of my own life. I had to stand up and be a hero for myself. And um, I, I tell you, it was soon after, you know, things, little things started happening and things started coming together. One job led to the other. And then it got to a point I was do my kids were now in uh, freshmen's in college and I got a series called Instant Mom. At the very end of Instant Mom, I got Ray Donovan. So I was doing Ray Donovan and Instant Mom at the same time, going from comedy to drama, comedy to drama. Then I did another 
series, I think it was called One Mississippi, or that might have been before. And I'm playing this autistic woman, you know, a woman on the spectrum, but high functioning. And I was just like, okay, God, okay, it's it's different, you know, and all of that. And everything started coming together. And it was just like steps up on a ladder, getting me to where I am now. But I had to get to that place where I could realize you can carry on. You can do this. Isn't that what you tell everybody else, Shirley Ralph? Isn't that what you tell everybody else? You can make it through the storm. Isn't that what you tell them? If you're going to be like a little cat, you better dig those claws in. Isn't that what you say? Put on a happy face. Isn't that what you say? Well, girl, this is your moment right here. That's why I tell people I don't talk about things. I talk about what I know. I don't talk about what Mm. I think I know. I talk about what I know. Talk about what I have experienced. I can tell you what I know for a fact in life. And when I say you can make it, you can make it. You just have to have that moment where you decide it for yourself. Because it doesn't matter what anybody else wants for you. If you don't want it for yourself, it ain't going to happen. <laughs> for real. <laughs> You, you are so right. It, it's, you know, it's interesting d- doing this podcast. It's uh, mm-hmm. a constant reminder that I have to practice what I preach. I can't be the advocate for everyone chasing their dreams and pushing through and letting their trials transform into their triumphs if I'm not living it. I have to live it Thank too. You. It's so important it. because here's the thing about it. Words have power, but what's behind the words is energy. And so I have to emanate the energy, not only that I want people to be able to receive, but also that I want to receive. Energy matches energy. That's how the world works. You know, we've been talking a lot about just the ebbs and flows of life. And especially being an artist, I think that Sometimes the seas get extra rocky for artists because we do face an exorbitant amount of rejection and quote unquote closed doors uh, that sometimes other people don't experience. And, and, you know, I heard you say that balance is really important to you. It's at the core of who you are. So how do you prioritize balance in your life? How do you do it? Oh, it's just a part of me. When I have to stop, I have to stop. When I can go no further, I can go no further. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, when I need to rest, I'm going to rest. My husband is always saying to me, why are you sleeping? Why are you resting? And I have to sometimes say to him, "Um, why are you not sleeping? Why are you not resting? Um, Because you need to rest. I think that sleep and rest are some of the most underrated things in the world. People do not take rest seriously. People think they just need to work hard and work themselves to death. No, you need to rest, too, while you're working hard. We're all going to die, but you don't need to get there any sooner. Rest. Take a nap. It'll be fine. All will still be well. It will. So I love, you're right, rest can help you maintain balance. Rest is a part of balance. We hear it all the time in life. When when things get crazy, be still. Things get crazy, center yourself. When things get cra- crazy, accent the positive, eliminate the negative. We get all these sing- these um, sayings and actions that we just need to pay attention to more and take. Yeah. When when things get crazy, I know that it's time to surrender. Like it's just I have to just give it up. Like, Jesus, take the wheel. I I don't know what's going on anymore. You know better than me anyway, so I'll follow your lead. You know, like, that's kind of how it has to be. Um, So I want to talk, before we kind of close out, I got to get into Abbott. What has this season been like in your life? And I want, and and I, 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 I mostly want to know, from the outside looking in, it looks like you've got to be like, God, you keep bringing me so far. And I cannot wait. 
I, I'm, in, I'm embracing this moment. I'm so grateful for this moment. But if you're doing this and you've done all that you've done before, I am so excited for whatever else you have for me. So is that what this moment feels like for you? Mm. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, I, I know it's going to offer me the ability to do so many things more than I would like to do, whether that's pr- producing writing, um, creating more shows, doing some of the things I've always wanted to do, because it's always important to be multi-aspirational as an artist. As my um, one of my favorite mentors, um, Miss um, Virginia Capers, she said, you have to have many streams of income. You have to have mm. many streams and talents. You know, it's, it's a very challenging business and it's going to become more so. She would tell me, act, sing, and write in another language because <laughs> one is not enough. <laughs> I'll never forget it. So I know it's going to be the platform that allows me to do more. Yeah. Oh, mm-hmm. this, I'm just so grateful for you. This is this is a conversation that just like you're referencing so many people that have shaped your life, I'll always yeah. reference this. Always. Aww, I know I will. You. Yeah. What What would you say has been your biggest takeaway from our conversation today? I think that, you know, okay, this is going to sound crazy, but once again, my I called her Aunt Virginia. Uh, Virginia Capers, great actress, won the Tony for the musical Raisin on Broadway. And I met her when I was 19, and she was in my life, my my professional life and my personal life throughout my whole career. And Aunt Virginia said, Cheryl, be as nice as you can for as long as you can to as many people as you can, because the same you kick today, you might have to kiss tomorrow. So just Mm -hmm. like you could meet me at 21 and me have an impact, however large or small on you, the years pass and here we are talking as you expand in your platform and I get to be, I get to grace as, as the woman that you met back then. And here we are talking as professionals together. Be as kind as you can for as long as you can, because you just never know who will be the next to ascend and you moving on up. How about that? Mm. Well, uh, that's beautiful. And I really received that. And it ties into my takeaway. My takeaway is uh, this whole time, I feel like God's just been tapping me, tapping me and saying, look at where you are. Look at who you're talking to. Look at where you're headed. So it's I'm having a surreal moment. And honestly, a moment of peace. I've been so... Worry might not be the word, but I've been so anxious about like where I'm headed. And if I and if I'll go all the places God and I have talked about us going to. And to me yeah. in this moment, he's saying, look, look, look at who you're talking to and what you're talking about and where you're talking about it. Look at it. There you go. And I and I am just overwhelmed by this moment. And I'm so grateful. So I have to share something with you. When you're anxious, when you're anxious about anything, that is worry about something you cannot control. You're worrying about something in the future that you cannot control. Mm -hmm. So I would say to anybody, do not worry about what is not in your control. It's not in your control. It's not in your control. Do not worry about it because you cannot control it. Relax and know that whatever is for you is going to be for you. You will never miss anything that was for you to begin with. Mm. So don't worry about it because what is for you can be on for you. Right. <laughs> well, listen, I who that I'm telling you, I'm just gonna be quoting this for till the end of my days. Um, but I just want to say, I thank you, I love you, and I honor you. 
Back at you, baby queen. Yes. <laughs> After the credits, Cheryl Lee Ralph lets us know who she thinks was the Beyonce of the Bible and why. Thank you so much for listening. This podcast is produced by LWC Studios for OWN. The show's executive producer is Juleka Lentigua. Its senior editor is Verilyn Williams. Sound designer is Cedric Wilson. Managing producers are Camille Stennis and Paulina Velasco. Assistant producers are Michelle Baker and Shanice Tyndall. If you enjoyed listening to this episode, and we hope you do, please make sure to subscribe, leave a rating, and review wherever you listen to your podcasts to ensure you hear the next one. Who is your favorite diva of all time from history and why? Ooh. Believe it or not, it was, um, oh my God, she's in the Bible. And she's the one, you know, there's a whole chapter in the Bible about women submitting to their husbands. And see, I hate it. You ask me something that I'm actually kind of passionate about. Anyway, the husband, the king, and I, I got to go back and look this up. But the husband, the king, got drunk with some of his boys and he called for his wife, who was basically the Beyonce of her time. She was a grand, wonderful diva. And so it's like Jay-Z is the king, right? Beyonce is the queen. This is the Bible now we're talking about. Jay-Z gets drunk with his boys. He calls down Beyonce and he says, Beyonce, I need you to drop it like it's hot. And Beyonce, the queen, the diva in the Bible, right? I got to remember her name. She says, hold up. I am the queen, the queen bee. I do not drop it like it's hot for no drunk king, much less a drunk king and his boys. The the king gets angry because the queen has had sense to speak up for herself and writes this whole decree that women should submit to their husband. Anyway, so that's how that decree came up. So my favorite diva of all time would be the queen bee diva in the Bible who said to the king, I do not bow down and I will not drop it like it's hot. Huh, I love her. Come on now. Come, what, was it Vashti? I think it was oh, Vashti. Okay. Yes. Queen Vashti. Vashti, Vashti. Yes, that is my favorite all time diva. I love yes, this queen story. Vashti. Come on, Queen Vashti. It's the truth too. That was good. That was good, y'all. Thank you. That was good. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you.